Good afternoon everyone, my name is Benjamin, and today we're getting right back into it, um, discussing the history of the United States, particularly looking at uh, some of the political events that have happened, but also just telling the story of the history. And we're continuing our discussion on the Jefferson administration. Like I said, there are three parts to it. Three parts closer to five, because there's a lot of stuff that happened in the Jefferson administration. And we're talking about <clears throat> the impeachment of Samuel Chase. Now, for those of you who don't know, by the way, Samuel Chase is the person on screen. Uh, not me down in the corner. Hi. But uh, the person whose oil painting is seated right there. And also, before we get too far into this, I'm going to uh, say a like, a comment, and subscription is greatly appreciated. I really want to thank everybody who subscribed over the weekend. I basically couldn't go about... Uh, I, I got a fair few amount of subscriptions over the weekend. Um, so I really want to thank all y'all. And I definitely, definitely want to thank everybody who has liked and commented over the past little bit. Um, likes and comments, of course, they help the algorithm not hate me. And subscriptions, they help the channel grow. Obviously, I do have a goal to reach a 1,000 at the end of the year. We'll see if that happens. I'm optimistic. But anyway, we're going to get right into it. So the impeachment of Samuel Chase begins with explaining who was Samuel Chase. Well, he was a signatory on the Declaration of Independence, and he was a representative in the Maryland General Assembly. Um, he actually wound up serving in the Continental Congress until 1778. That said, his reputation was damaged because of insider trading. Yes, even back in the 1770s, insider trading was a thing. Um, <laughs> but he moved to Baltimore after the revolution and he was appointed chief justice to a district criminal court in Baltimore by the state of Maryland and served there until 1796 and he was also the Chief Justice of the Maryland General Court until 1796 when George Washington appointed Samuel Chase to the Supreme Court as an Associate Justice and Chase actually served on the court for the remainder of his life so from 1796 to 1811, and that's a span of 17 years, which is relatively close to the average, though in modern times justices do serve a lot longer. <clears throat> but around 1800, there was an election, of course. Jefferson won, and the Republicans, they swept the House, the Senate, uh, to put it another way, there were 25 Republicans and 9 Federalists. Uh, this was, of course, by 1805, by the way. Um, but Chase began butting heads with Republicans. And there was some other interesting stuff going on. So... The Judiciary Act of 1801 was repealed because Jefferson didn't like the bureaucracy of having so many lower courts created by Federalists and full of Federalist judges who had lifetime appointments. But... Samuel Chase was not very careful about allowing his political opinions to get public. 
and he was not a fan of the repeal of the Judiciary Act. Um, he denounced it to a... Uh, he denounced it when giving charge to a Baltimore grand jury and saying that it would lead to mobocracy or the rule of the mob. Um, while he was a district judge in 1800. By the way, just as a little heads up, for a very long time, Supreme Court judges or Supreme Court justices also served as judges in other parts and actually toured giving ruling in various different matters, right? And he had made the very strong attacks upon someone in his role as a judge regarding the Alien and Sedition Acts. Remember those? Those are still around, by the way. Um, and Chase had effectively become a prosecutor rather than a judge in that case, according to some witnesses. In 1800, uh, there was a grand jury in Newcastle, Delaware, that declined to indict someone for basically seditious behavior. However, he refused to discharge or, you know, release the grand jury because he thought that the jury needed to charge this guy. Now, Jefferson and most of the Republicans definitely saw this as poor behavior. And I'm actually inclined to agree with that, by the way. Um, if you're a judge and the jury doesn't want to indict, well, the jury can't be forced to stay there until they give charge because that removes the idea of innocent until proven guilty. If the jury doesn't believe the guy did it, don't force the jury to press charges or move it to the trial phase. Hey. So, yeah, he, he was definitely pushing the bounds of acceptable behavior. Personally, I think he crossed that line, but let's be careful. Um, Jefferson wrote to a congressman from Maryland say, basically saying, ought the seditious and official attack on the principles of our Constitution to go unpunished? Specifically referring to Chase. Um, eventually, John Randolph of Roanoke, Virginia congressman, took them up and wrote charges of impeachment. And the House of Representatives served Chase with eight articles. In 1803, one of which was involving a trial of a guy named John Fries, or Fries, I say Fries. A few more focused on political libel, um, more specifically the trial regarding political libel of James uh, Callender. One article dealt with the Newcastle Grand Jury. And... There were three articles focused on procedural errors, and the eighth article was basically directed at intemperate, inflammatory, peculiarly, peculiarly indecent and unbecoming, uh, highly unwarrantable and highly indecent remarks while charging or authorizing a Baltimore grand jury. Um, in 1804, The House voted overwhelmingly to impeach Chase, 73 to 32. And the U.S. Senate now had to begin the impeachment trial, right? And that began a, pretty much a year later in February of 1805. And Vice President Aaron Burr, uh, presided. Uh, the inauguration hadn't happened. Yeah, inauguration day wasn't always January 20th. That that changed. 
I actually want to say that was the 22nd or... Yeah, I think that was the 22nd Amendment. It may have been the 25th. I'm pretty sure it was the 22nd Amendment, though. <clears throat> now, all of the courts that were involved in this were lower courts, so none of this was behavior while he was on the Supreme Court. And a lot of people felt that the heart of the allegations was that there was political bias that had led Chase to treat defendants differently than he would in other matters. Uh, basically saying that he was treating certain defendants who were not Federalists or were anti-Federalist in some way, shape, or form in a blatantly unfair manner. And I would actually agree with that. He definitely was doing that. Now, Chase's defense lawyers called it a prosecution, or called the prosecution a political effort by the Republicans. Um, in answer to the articles of impeachment, Chase argued that all of his actions were motivated by adherence to stare decisis or precedent, uh, as well as a judicial duty to restrain advocates from improper statements of law and considerations of judicial efficiency. I think in some ways, yeah, to an extent that's probably correct, specifically with the uh, procedural errors that can happen from anyone, and I don't think that's really worthy of articles of impeachment, but whatever. The issue, though, is that he definitely was treating people who didn't like the Federalist or who were vaguely anti-government in writing or speech differently than he would people who were pro-government in writing or speech or otherwise. Um, eventually, the Senate voted on March the 1st. And there were, of course, eight ballots because each charge was, or each article was voted on separately. And there were 34 senators present, 25 Republicans, 9 Federalists. And that established 23 votes needed to reach the two-thirds majority for conviction slash removal from office. Now remember, just because you vote to uh, vote guilty, you know, convict on an article, does not mean you have to remove from office. You can say, well, the, he's guilty, but kind of a minor crime. Doesn't really deserve removal, but he's guilty. Um, but most of the time, removal from office is the punishment that's on the table. Not always, but m the vast majority of the time. And, well, to be fair, the Jefferson administration didn't handle the prosecution very well. I think if they argued certain cases better, they could have gotten him, shut up, phone. I think if they argued the case better from what I've read, um, they could absolutely, absolutely have convicted him of the charge regarding the Newcastle, Delaware grand jury. I think that was a slam dunk case and, and you can, I'm going to explain just how poorly the Republicans um, performed in getting senators to vote for conviction. Because the closest vote was regarding the Baltimore grand jury. And when I say closest vote, I mean closest vote, you know, vote closest to getting him removed. And that was 18 for conviction, 16 for acquittal. Yeah, and he is still, to this day, the only Supreme Court justice to be impeached. And I'm not even sure anyone has tried to impeach a Supreme Court justice since, because 
it's generally regarded as a poor idea. The Supreme Court, especially nowadays, is the most popular branch of the government, or more accurately, the most approved of branch of government, and is the most trusted branch of government, and it far outscores the other two branches, which people just hate. Um, basically, it set the concept that the judiciary should refrain from partisan politics and set in stone the, the idea of judicial independence. And most of the votes were lopsided in margin for acquittal and it kind of set a precedent that you don't impeach judges. While it's certainly something you can do, just don't do it because even if you disagree with a judge, you really should only impeach them not because you disagree with them, not because they're not interpreting the Constitution the way you interpret the Constitution. You should only go after judges, even other federal judges, for actual crimes or ethical issues. Um, and it has to be reasonably provable. So, you know, bribery or actual crimes and it has to be somewhat recent right and judicial performance is completely off the table and judges since particularly federal judges and Supreme Court judges are especially tight-lipped on this one but they are very closely guarded when it comes to making comments on politics. You'll almost never hear them comment on political issues or political campaigns or anything. There's a reason why it made headline news when uh, the late Justice Ginsburg was not a fan of Donald Trump and said so publicly. And a lot of the senators who voted against conviction felt that Jefferson's grounds were more about the quality slash disagreement with his interpretation and in judging rather than his uh, rather than any crime or ethical issue. Um, of course, Chase lived until 1811 and was on the Supreme Court for the entire time. I actually don't know how many opinions he wrote, nor any prominent ones, but anyway, that's going to end it for today. I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. See you next time. Take it easy. Bye-bye.